Hi, welcome to Almost Cooperstown. I'm Mark. And this is Gordon. And we love talking about baseball. So we wanted to talk about official scoring for a while. Um, and there's a pretty long history in baseball more than any other sport. Um, when's the last time you scored a baseball game, Gordon? Oh, when you, wow. you were doing the scoring. I mean, I was doing it a lot in high school, obviously, because, you know, whenever I wasn't pitching for the game, they're just like, oh, yeah, you do the scorebook or you at least keep the pitch count. Mm-hmm. And then we would usually I mean, we would sometimes bring our own scorebooks to the Met game. Sometimes we would get programs to score. They were definitely better when we used our own scorebooks. So. Right, but it wasn't the crummy little one that you got. I, in, I, I in mean, the card. <laughs> no, yeah, I, I'd say it's probably been about 10 years yeah, now, yeah, but yeah. I don't think it would be hard for me to ever pick it back up again. No, <laughs> no. Kind of like well, ride and, a bike. And, Baseball has a you know the longest history, obviously, uh, of official scoring. Other sports do have official scores, right? There'll be official scores in basketball and I guess football. I don't even know what you'd have an official score for in football uh, necessarily, other than to get particular stats and you know uh, pass defenses. And but that that's not, that's a stat keeper, not necessarily. A yeah, score. right, right, right. Different. And hockey, this the same thing. But baseball is is it? There have um, only been um, a few uh, female official scores in the history of baseball. Uh, and we are really fortunate today on our podcast because we got one. We, not only do we have one, we have the only one. And, and Jillian Geib, who is the official scorer for the Colorado Rockies, uh, is going to join the podcast right now. Jillian, welcome. We're happy that you're with us. Thank you so much for having me. I cannot wait to um, dig into some official scoring talk. And I'm just so thankful to be here. Tell us, um, if you will, a little bit. Um, it, it's been fairly recent that you have taken on the uh, the official scoring position in Colorado, but you've been working around baseball for a while. Maybe you can kind of give us a little bit of uh, how you got to now. Yeah, so kind of like you, I grew up watching baseball. I grew up actually going to Rockies games um, as a kid, and I we were not the type of family where you could just zone out or walk around the concourse and get food and you know be admiring other things around the ballpark. You had to be watching the game. In fact. We had one of those over the head um, headsets, radio headsets that we would turn on during the game so that we could be listening to the game while watching the game just to make sure we didn't miss any of the action. So um, definitely from an early age, I have been watching kind of from more of a technical um, mindset. Um, But then also just in terms of myself playing, I grew up playing. My sister is six years older than me, and she um, started playing baseball at a very young age and transitioned into softball, like so many females do. And I kind of followed that same trajectory. Um, And we both played softball throughout high school. Um, She went on to play in college. I, however, decided that probably did not have a future playing. Um, So I kind of took a different route and decided I wanted to stay connected to the sport through journalism. Um, And I kind of wanted to go into broadcast journalism and be like a sideline reporter. So um, that's kind of where I went with my career. And I went to Boston University, studied studied journalism, got a really great internship out of college, um, just kind of was on that trajectory. And then I met a good friend of mine who worked for Major League Baseball. And um, he hooked me up with a job um, on their kind of pitch tracking stat cast side as it was just getting started. And I, I kind of realized, you know, maybe I'll be a little bit taken more seriously um, on this side of things for my knowledge of the game. So um, from there, I just have uh, been working for Major League Baseball for nine years now and have kind of worked pretty much every different position that they staff at the ballpark um, in terms of the statistics side. Um, And then in this past offseason, one of the official scorers um, at Coors Field decided to resign. And so my bosses behind the scenes just kind of had a discussion and said, well, Jillian's pretty much done everything else that there is at the ballpark. So why don't we, I mean, this seems like the next logical step for her. So why don't you give it a try? And kind of the rest is history. Did they know it was a big deal to bring you in as the only female official scorer in major league baseball and the first one in a long time? Yeah, I think, um, they didn't really, none of us really knew it was going to be this big of a deal. Um, but they did, they were really excited about it. My boss was incredibly excited about it, was very thrilled to be hiring me specifically as a woman. Um, And he said, you know, I think this is, I think this is going to be big. I think Mm -hmm. this is going to make um, some changes. So 
I think he was aware and, and we were all aware that it was a big deal, but not necessarily this big of a deal. So the, the first uh, uh, female official scorer uh, went by, by E. Green in the scorecard um, because did not want to uh, indicate that, in fact, she was a woman. And that was um, many, many years ago. Uh, but more recently, uh, there was a, a one in San Francisco uh, who uh, did it, I think, for both the A's and the Giants. Correct. Yeah. So she worked for Oakland um, and in San Francisco. She, I believe, started in 1985. Yes, I, th- I think it's Susan Fornoff might be might might have been her name, and and in our in our prep call you had mentioned that somebody uh, sent a rat um, to uh, it was Susan Fornoff who got sent the rat, and so because I'm crazy and I had to look it up, uh, I did, and it was Dave Kingman who sent her the rat and on Dave Kingman. Okay. So, you know, was around when I was a, when I was a kid, Dave Kingman was playing for the Mets and he was a, a surly, um, not very nice person. And everybody knew that then, um, you know, so for him to do that, I went and found a stat today, the today or, or yesterday, and I put it up as our trivia question, which nobody has gotten yet. So who the one player who has the lowest B war with the more than 400 home runs in major league history, that would be Dave. Kingman. So, um, you know, <laughs> terrible on him for doing that. He didn't think that Susan Fornoff should be in the locker rooms and he was kind of a cretin. Uh, and so that's how he handled it. And may nothing like that happen to you. I don't think the game is in that place today. And, and, and I hope you feel the same. Yeah, I certainly have not gotten any negative feedback so far. So I think we're on the right track. But yeah, I mean, I think a direct quote from Susan Fornoff is that he, his feelings were a lady should be a lady. And, you know, I definitely think even just in the last 10 or so years that has shifted, we're seeing a lot more females taking roles um, in sports in general, but definitely in baseball. And I'm just really excited, really, really excited to, to have gotten this opportunity, not because I want the recognition myself, but I feel like the recognition is going to make it more normal and less of a special, unique thing. You know, it's just, I just, it's going to get the ball rolling mm-hmm. um, to the point where this is just much more common. So uh, you are, are, do you have any desire to do play by play? I just, just was thinking of that because um, I don't know. Susan Walman does radio play by play here in New York for the Yankees. Uh, I don't know if any uh, Jessica Mendoza did it for ESPN a little bit, but I'm really not sure if any, um, in the booth, regular, you know, uh, color or lead play-by-play uh, female. Are there any? Uh- y- yes, actually, in Colorado, we are fortunate to have one of the very few in Jenny Kavnar. Um, oh, she, I know that name. Yeah. yeah, she grew up around the game. Her dad was, I believe, a, a coach um, for many, many years, uh, and so she's definitely been a role model. I connected with her before I, you know, made my debut as official scorer, and I've obviously seen her around all these years that we've both been at Coors Field. Um, but she, you know, just had nothing but positive things to say and has, has since congratulated me and, and been really great. And, and definitely growing up, Jessica Mendoza was a huge, um, you know, role model for me, followed her with U.S. Women's Softball. And so, yeah, I think um, it's not as well known, which I actually think is a good thing. I think it's good that we don't know, oh, that, you know, that woman is doing that because it just means that hopefully it's going to become more commonplace the and it's just going to. Yeah, it's like you yeah. don't even have to comment on it because she's just a commentator. There, it's exactly. not like you're not the you're not the only official, you know, uh, woman that's scoring from the major league baseball. You're just one of them, and it's just kind of part of the game now. It's weaved into the fabric. Exactly. Yeah, it's not noteworthy. It's just like, oh yeah, those are the play. You know, that's the play by play person. That's the official score, and it's not like that's the female play by play. You right. know. Yeah. Like, so what it, what is it like though? Because I mean, obviously you are showing up to the Coors Field just like everybody else on game day. Like, what's a game day like for you? Um, that's a great question because it changes with every position that I work. It's definitely different. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, I definitely um, show up about an hour before and have a bunch of prep work to do. And in terms of official scoring, um, I need to make sure that I have the daily stats pack. So that's all of the different statistics for all the different players. Um and pitchers specifically um, that they provide to us before the game. And it's kind of at our spot. And I just look through it and record that for everyone, for the starting pitcher, things like that. 
Um, and for me, I'm not necessarily one of those people who memorizes statistics very well. <laughs> I don't know every statistic of every player known to man. So that's really important for me to just, um, as soon as I get there, I really absorb that and kind of take a look at it deeply. Um, but then I just make sure that my lineup, my scorecard is ready. Um, I have my, my pitching lines ready to go. And then, yeah, I'm just kind of getting myself in the, in the mindset to, to keep score for the game, but really it doesn't, it doesn't change a whole lot when I'm working in other positions around the ballpark. I just, um, you know, set up my computers, set up all the technology that I need for the game. And, and I'm just excited. I also spend a lot of time walking around the ballpark and, and visiting with people because I now have so many friends. I've made so many friends around the ballpark. So that's an important part of my pregame routine as well. That's cool. That's cool. So um, is it a um, collaborative uh, experience to score in the game? Are there other score, special scorers from the other team there? Is there consultation? I have this envision in the old days of the score there and there'd be like three reporters and they go, what did you get for that? You know, and, and that kind of thing. Is, is that what's going on? That is really not what's going on in terms of official scoring. We're definitely more of an island. Um, and, and they want us to be so that we're not influenced at all by any, anyone else in the press box or anyone else around us, um, in making our decisions. You know, they really emphasize that they trust us, um, and our knowledge and our ability to make the calls. Um, but at the same time, as I mentioned, you know, some of the other positions that I, that I work, we all kind of work as a team. So we're all, um, working together to maybe spot things that happen during the game. So, you know, if it's a shift and it's not your typical double play, or if it's a, you know, a five, three, instead of a six, three, um, things like that will kind of call out during the game. Um, or we'll ask about also in particular, you know, if a ball is blocked in the dirt versus just a regular ball, or if it's a called strike versus a swinging strike, those are types of things that we kind of work together as a team to be able to spot and make sure that we have it right. But ultimately as an official scorer, it is my job to be the final say in that. So I'll kind of be the one announcing it. Um, but occasionally I miss something, you know, we're all, we're all human. So it's not like um, I'm not willing to ask um, if, if I didn't see something. And I, I think that's actually one of the more interesting parts about baseball scoring is that you do kind of have that ability to go back after the game and change the scoring calls, you know, you don't, you get, I mean, you get that in some places, but you know, I mean, I think you've even mentioned dad, like that, like Ty Cobb ended up with like one more hit over the course of his career. Another guy lost a hit somewhere in his career. So people go back even well after the game and review these plays. I think that's, that, that's a really interesting aspect of baseball scoring. Yeah. And that's something that's changed significantly in the last several years with all the technology that we have available. I mean, so just in game situations, um, we have 24 hours as official scorers to change our calls. Mm. Um, and that could absolutely happen if we take a look at the video replay of, of a, uh, you know, a ground ball, or even if we look at the stat cast data, um, if it was coming off the bat at 107 miles per hour, you know, and the fielder misplayed it versus if it was coming off the bat at 80 miles per hour, those kinds of things that I find out later, um, can definitely make me change a call. And if a player requests that I take another look at a call, I'm absolutely going to do that. And I'm absolutely going to be open-minded to changing it. Um, and then also actually we have um, in official scoring, we have 72 hours um, to change a call where if a team or a player requests it, it can be actually sent off to a committee um, in New York who then will review it and make a decision as a committee. So it's definitely not, set in stone, as you say, you know, things can be changed after the fact for sure. It's, it's happened before, you know, Gordon, when you were talking about it, it made me think of Phil Rizzuto, um, the Hall of Famer, was uh, with the Yankees for years, and, 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 and broadcasters keep books, you know, and they probably look kind of weird, everybody, you know, broadcasters particularly known for having weird score books and whatnot, and Rizzuto had a scoring um, notation WW in his, which basically meant wasn't watching. So he, he didn't see didn't see the play and he would mark that in there. But in, in 53, um, he had an error that was changed to a bad hop hit that gave the, the Senators Mickey Va Vernon the batting title over Al Rosen by two one thousandths of a point. Now, at the time, Rizzotto said he didn't want to rob a good guy like like Vernon of a hit. And so they turn it over and sure enough, Al Rosen loses the batting title by two one thousandths of a point. I, I just think that's just so interesting that something so small can mean such a difference in, in, in the history of baseball. 
Absolutely. And that's the thing as an official scorer, you kind of feel that pressure, you know, you definitely feel the pressure of having to make a decision that could literally impact a player's career. Right. Um, and obviously players, you know, get upset when you make certain calls, but that's the thing you kind of have to keep in mind is no matter what, somebody's going to be upset. Um, if you, if you have to make a judgment call, you're not going to be able to please everybody, right? Somebody on some side of the situation is going to be upset. So just hey, definitely have to keep that in mind. You either got somebody losing a hit or getting an error. Somebody's going to be annoyed about that. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So it's really not about, you know, making somebody happy or making the call that's going to look the best on paper. It's really just about trying to make the call that is right. So we've had, I think this year, I think it's seven no hitters, which is, I, I think we're one short of the all time no hitters for a season already uh, as, as we are in June. And there has to be more pressure on an official scorer, right? You're in the seventh inning, there haven't been any hits. And now you're kind of hoping that there aren't any close plays. <laughs> Exactly. I mean, I, I know in my first game, I was literally sitting there kind of thinking that I'm like, please, you know, don't don't have there be some weird scoring call where I have to make some crazy decision. Um, yeah. In the game right now, it's just it has evolved so much into being, you know, a, really a battle between amazing pitchers and amazing hitters. Um, and so you definitely feel it as an official scorer these days. You definitely feel it. But I also know that most of the guys who are official scorers now have been around for years and years and years and years. Um, and even myself, you know, I, I obviously don't have the legendary careers that these guys have, but I have watched a lot of baseball. I have watched baseball over and over and over again. So, you know, with, with those games and that repetition comes the ability to see certain things that, you know, a lot of people don't necessarily see when they look at a play. So last season, uh, 2020, the pandemic season, obviously didn't go to the ballparks. Nobody did. Um, and you scored games via video, I I'd assume. How, how did that season change scoring, obviously, going forward? Right now we're starting to go back to ballparks. What's different today and what will never be the same possibly because of what happened last year? That's another really great question. So it's funny, in talking to a bunch of official scorers, um, you know, from last year, um, what you had to do was essentially watch the broadcast of the game from home, but you couldn't have any audio, right? Because they don't want you hearing any of the decisions before you make a decision, right? You had to just be watching it with no audio at all, um, which is, as I'm sure you guys would agree, is very different than watching a game live because you can't get every angle. You can't see every, you know, part of the game. But that is also why the technology that we have these days is so incredible and so useful because we actually do have a program that allows us to see, you know, a, a third base, high, you know, a third base camera angle or a high home camera angle, or, you know, on the other side, you know, first base, like that just allows us to be able to somewhat see the plays from as many different angles as, as are going to help us. Um, and then now that we're back at the ballparks, we use, we still use that to make our decisions. Uh, we still use those different camera angles. We're also looking at, you know, hit hit data, like the speed off the bat, the angle off the bat, the distance that it traveled, the height. Um, all of those things are now available to us. And uh, in talking to some of these official scores that have been around for a long time, they're really amazed and thankful to have that technology to be able to help them make their decisions. Yeah, I can totally get that just from like the comparison you got. Now we track the exit velocity of every ball and you're like, you know what? That Stanton, you know, line drive to third base was hit at like 115 miles an hour. The guy was just trying to get out of the way and survive, not make a play. Exactly. I mean, how do you react to that, to, to a ball coming that quickly? I mean, you you obviously can react, but it's, you know, it's similar to a penalty kick in soccer, right? The, the ball is traveling so quickly that, the goalie makes a reaction, makes a split second reaction, and sometimes goes the opposite way that the ball yeah, is yeah, traveling. It, it, it's as much prediction as it is self-defense. Exactly. Right. Exactly. And baseball has become a lot of that. I mean, guys are hitting the ball hard. So <laughs> they smoke some of those balls. The, um, yeah. How about the, you know, the fielders themselves, right? We, we, um, 
we, we love Derek Jeter. We pick on him sometimes a little bit, only from the standpoint, from a defensive standpoint. And we had Reyes in New York playing shortstop at the same time that Jeter was here. And, and as a fielding shortstop, we thought Reyes had greater range and did some things that Jeter, who won gold gloves and was a very steady fielder, but because his range was clearly more limited than some other shortstops in the game, I don't think anybody would contest that. Do you score an error for him differently by a ball he didn't get to that he should have got to? Or how do you put in the individual uh, uh, exploits of the fielder into a scoring decision? Absolutely. That is um, a really big part of it, right? And in the rule book, it states, um, you know, a hit is something that cannot be fielded with normal or natural effort, right? And so then that leaves a lot of subjectivity but you kind of have to think, okay, would more than 50% of shortstops in the game make this play or would less than 50% of shortstops? So you really cannot consider the outliers. Um, and in, in uh, Colorado, we were definitely spoiled with Nolan Arnato at third base. You know, he makes a huge percentage of plays that look easy to him, but that the, your average third baseman does not make. And so for him, it's, it definitely takes a different eye. You know, you can't, you really can't score a lot of things as errors if it's going to not be a normal effort for most fielders. If, yeah, if Nolan Arenado was the only guy in the league that made that play at third base, just because his replacement can't make that play doesn't mean it's an error. It just means he's not exactly. a gold glove third baseman. He's, he's the and kid. It's the, actually he's pretty the, funny. He's the kid in the class that ruins the curve. You know, you really don't like him at all because <laughs> Exactly. He ruins the curve. And it's really funny because his cousin is now playing third base in Colorado. And so you really don't want to compare the two um, because it could create some family rivalry. (laughs) (laughs) Which one was better? (laughs) Exactly. Exactly. You mentioned, I think, when we spoke that you scored, were scoring multiple games at one time. Can you tell us a little thing about that? There might be more than one game that you're responsible for. Are are they simultaneous? Are they consecutive? How, How does that work? Yeah, well, so one of my other positions that I work um, in the ballpark requires um, a different kind of scoring. It's essentially just keeping track of different play events, mostly just balls, you know, strikes, um, outs, hits, runs, errors. That's pretty much the the gist of it. Um, and it's it's for a totally different part of the statistics side. Um, but anyways, it's a different way of keeping score. And I also actually work support for that role. So when there's games going on um, at other ballparks and the Rockies are out of town, I get to be watching multiple games and just kind of supporting the operators of, of those games. So if they have issues or if they enter a play incorrectly, I can help them fix it um, because it's not necessarily as immediate as an, as an official scoring decision. It's just something that needs to be correctly inputted you know, for the records. So your scorebook itself, um, I'd like, what does it look like? Is it color coded? Do you have your own personal style? Um, do you chart balls and strikes? Uh, you know, tell us what, what, what does yours look like? Yeah. And I really truly think that scorekeeping is an art form. I think it is mm. very unique to every individual. And I think that's one of the great parts of it is my scorekeeping has evolved over many years, but also it changes from game to game when I have different roles. Um, But as an official scorekeeper, something that I have adapted thanks to one of my good mentors who has been helping me um, since I was promoted to this position. um, And he's now scored more games at Coors Field than any other scorekeeper in history at our ballpark. Um, So he's got lots of experience. He knows exactly what to be looking for, things like that. So he's been mentoring me and he's helped me to kind of adjust my scorekeeping even more to include colors, as you say. Um, So I now keep my scorecard when I'm doing official scoring using lots of different colors. And the purpose behind that is just to make sure that when I'm going over things and checking to make sure everything is exact Um, or even, you know, compiling pitching lines, things like that. I need to be able to look at my scorecard and quickly pick out specific items. I need to pick out strikeouts. I need to pick out walks. I need to pick out errors, um, things like that. So that is why I definitely have adjusted to include colors in my scorecard. Um, Whereas before having this position, I never even thought to do that. So um, one of the plays in baseball that falls to the official score is crediting the pitcher 
with a win, right? When the starting pitcher leaves with the lead after, before five innings. Um, and you have to then decide the most effective pitcher uh, that you saw pitch. That. How, how, how does that work? Yeah, that's one of the tough ones that actually, you know, causes some causes some tension sometimes. Um, and yeah, it's that that's really that piece where you say the most effective, you know, if if a guy comes in and, and strikes out two batters, obviously you can understand that that would be more effective than a guy who gives up a couple hits, you know, but still doesn't allow any runs, but still is giving up hits versus strikeouts, you know, and so it's those little pieces that that really come into play when you're thinking about which of these relief pitchers is the most effective. It kind of comes down as like, is it the highest leverage situation? Is it who was the most like dominant in their outing? You know, that that's, it's such a subjective judgment call, but that's what makes it interesting. Exactly. And that is probably the most subjective, subjective, you know, piece really that we have as official scorekeepers um, that comes down to us and our decision-making a lot of these things, like we've talked about, we can look at and review different, you know, camera angles and different statistics, but in terms of, yeah, these, these pitchers and determining wins and losses and saves um, there is definitely a little bit more of a judgment call that comes on our part. Is there, is there one play or one game that you scored that you're like, yeah, well, that was, I don't know, that was a game that like, like, I, I'll never forget. Uh, is there one in particular? It is funny, actually. Um, the first thing that came to mind was just the first game of the season for the Rockies at Coors Field. Um, so, of course, it's iconic in itself, but a pretty incredible play happened where um, it was against the Dodgers. And I believe Justin Turner was at first base and Bellinger comes up and hits a home run but it was not necessarily an obvious home run, right? It was one of those that was just kind of barely over the fence. And so it like does one of those things where it like hits the area and nobody's quite sure based on the ballpark rules, if that's a home run or like an automatic double or something. Exactly. Yet another subjective or kind of, you know, weird thing about baseball is that every ballpark is different and and every ballpark has its own rules. Um, So yeah, it was one of those in, you know, in between home runs and Turner got confused and wasn't sure that it was a home run so started to run back towards first base um and then the two ended up crossing each other on the base paths which is against the rules um so you gotta you gotta call out the runner um you gotta give the give the assist to the nearest fielder um and that's just kind of yeah i i am glad that i was not in that situation you know i i am glad that it was um it was after some training and some some experience of just looking at games that i (laughs) <laughs> was in that situation because it would have been a definitely a difficult situation to score sort of sort of like robin ventura's grand slam single in 1999 uh so there you go it was also a, a weird play but those, that's a, i remember that play from this year because they made a lot of you know a lot of reporting about it and you're right that is a play that you know i'm sure the dodger fans will never forget you know and J- justin turner certainly won't Exactly. Well, and actually, um, and recently another home run event happened where I think it, um, I think it was a pirates player, um, Hayes. So a rookie and it was his first home run of the Hayes. season. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he, and he didn't step on first base as he was rounding the base pass. Right. So in that situation, they ended up, um, they just out of, I guess, precaution, they ended up throwing to first base, touching the base and it turned out that he did not touch the base. So he was out. Um, it's just like little things like that, you know, that I find quite fascinating um, that in the moment are very fun, but also a little nerve wracking to score. Well, something like that happens, right? And the next thing you know, Cooperstown's calling and asking for yours. And that's what a great honor that would be, right? I would think that as a scorer, that would be way up there that they called and they ask you for your scorebook. Absolutely. I mean, I'm definitely going to frame my first scorecard, you know, for my first game as an official score, but I'm kind of hoping, you know, maybe one day Cooperstown will request it and, and it will just, it will be in the hall of fame. <laughs> Well, Gordon, I, I think record. we should jump on this, Gordon. We should start lobbying for, you know, Cooper's <laughs> to say this is the first, you know, female score, uh, um, uh, official score in, in many, many years and the only official one. And this is historic um, because, Jillian, I think you have sort of broken, you know, the mold here and we should see a lot more of this uh, going forward. 
Definitely. Absolutely. And I think that I, I hope to have a long career in it. And I just, I know that the move is to get more females involved, even as soon as next season. So, and you know, now you're seeing you, uh, the Marlins GM is a woman. I think you're just going to see more and more of this going forward. And hopefully one day it'll be like you said, where we're just talking about these people without having to put any quantifiers in there. We're just saying, Oh yeah. The broadcaster for the Rockies or the GM for whichever team. Exactly. I think it's, it's on, it's in the future. It's on the horizon. Um, Mm -hmm. I definitely think we'll get there. We're well on our way. Well, Jillian, I want to, you know, on behalf of Gordon and I want to thank you for joining the podcast. Um, I I learned a lot about uh, official scoring that I didn't know. I I was going to ask about digital scoring, but it doesn't seem like um, that has really taken hold uh, in terms of a digital scorecard or something you might do on a tablet as opposed to writing it in a book. So, uh, yeah, you know, I've thought about it. And actually, I had I had um, spoken with one of the broadcasters for the Rockies who uses more of a digital format. Um, I, I have definitely thought about it. I've looked into different options. Um, but as of right now, I think it's just nice to have the paper copy and, and we, we need to keep records of every single game, you know, that is our responsibility too. So while a digital copy, obviously you feel like you could store that away forever. You also do lose digital things, you know, into cyberspace. So who knows, who knows what the future of digital scorekeeping is, but you can be sure I will be I will be in on the conversation because it's definitely something that has interested me. Right, right. There's a nostalgic part of always doing it, you know, uh, uh, pencil on paper and pen on paper. But, you know, if there are other tools, we should be thinking about how to integrate them into what we're doing, just like calling balls and strikes. Exactly, (laughs) exactly. And the game is changing, so we need to keep up with it. Well, Jillian, again, thank you. Um, we're happy you joined us. Uh, we, we think there's going to be a lot of people who are going to be interested to hear about you and your story. And we're going to start the Jillian uh, uh, for Cooperstown uh, scorecards uh, thing to make sure that, you know, they pay attention to what's really important. That is breaking the mold. So way to go. And, and thank you again. Excellent. Well, thank you guys. It's been such a pleasure. And, you know, I'm happy to come back anytime to talk about baseball. (laughs) If you do that, you're going to get an invitation. So thanks a lot. Thanks for listening. Subscribe to our podcast on your favorite platform. And you can follow us on Twitter at Almost Coop.